All right, guys. Today's the day. We're going to build Scarlet a new house. Let's go. Hooray! But first, let me tell you what I had to do to get this PVC. Only two stores in the entire state had PVC board in stock. Coronavirus! And the closest was an hour away. The only trailer we had available at the time was this tiny trailer. So now I'll show you how a tiny person gets not such tiny boards out of a tiny trailer. Let me put on my glasses. Safety first. So the biggest problem with the tiny trailer was not being able to fit a 4 by 8 sheet. That meant I had to get them to cut them down at the store in a two foot by four foot sections. Lowe's can rip any board under about an inch thick. The problem is they don't cut them square. So even though this is going to be a two foot by four foot enclosure, it's not as simple as just screwing the pieces together. I'm going to have to use a framing square and mark all these boards so I can cut them to perfectly square before I can even think about putting pieces together. So let's go start cutting. I don't feel right using a skill saw because I know my limits and I love my digits. So anything that I can't rip on my small table saw, I try to get a family member or a friend to help with, but I'm alone on this adventure. One day I'll stop pouring money into my animals and I'll invest in a track saw. But for now, I'll rely on my multi-tool and pure skill to get me through. But what I should really do is get the guy that loads to let me operate the saw so it can be cut right. Or even better yet, y'all can like and subscribe and my channel can blow up and I can build a shop and make my own track saw. Yeah! And this is where I underestimated the wind. I thought I could just prop the pieces up against each other and test fit before screwing them together. See, I have one major logistics issue. This enclosure is 24 inches wide. My house doors are only 21 inches wide. That means I'm gonna have to build this enclosure and take it apart to fit it into my house and reassemble it again. This will further complicate things when it comes to the steps of creating the background and the subsequent drying times. But despite the complications, I'm gonna done. I don't want to shave any off the dimensions of this enclosure because my girl's gonna need it. This is when I decided to stop fighting the wind and just put screws in it. I started by pre-drilling the holes with a countersink bit. PVC has a tendency to split especially if you want to drive the heads in flush. So I'm having to use my deck and the side of my house and my baseboard to hold everything flush long enough to get my screws started. It would have been nice to have a couple extra hands right here or maybe some clamps, but I didn't. So now that I got the bottom, the back, and the two sides together, I'm going to turn it over on the bottom. And because I know I'm going to have to take it apart and reassemble it in the house, I'm gonna make my life easier in the reassembling process by cutting some one inch wide bands of PVC and attach them along the edges of the sides and the back. This will make flushing up the edges of each piece effortless on reassembly. Some of you may be wondering if PVC cement is safe for an enclosure build. Well, initially I wasn't gonna use it, but realistically at this point, this enclosure will not be completed with Scarlet living in it for at least another three weeks. With all the stages it'll take to create the backgrounds, the water bowl, the dry time of each product, the smell of this cement will have plenty enough time to air out. Ask me how I know. How? How? Because I just got back from the future, and the amount of time I spent to build this enclosure, I could have built myself a new house. Seriously though, I put hundreds of hours into this build. I went a little crazy, experiment with products like expanded foam, dry lock, foam coat, Things like that, just keep watching, you'll see. All right, that's done. So I'm flipping it back over. I'm gonna start working on the front. I'm gonna frame out where the doors are gonna go and put it in the tracks to hold the doors. So the bulk of the PVC that I'm using for this build is a half inch thick, but I'm going with three quarter inch thick for the front. Not only is the track that's designed to hold two quarter inch thick doors, three quarter inches thick itself, but I feel better about the entire front structure that will be holding glass doors being thicker and having less flex. So what I'm placing in now is the lid. I have the enclosure upside down. I'm going to put the lid inside so that it's sitting flush on the ground. 
I can then put a few more bands of PVC around the front, the sides, and the back of the enclosure. Then when I flip it back over and the lid is placed on top, it'll have an edge to rest on at the right height so that it's flush with the top of the enclosure. Okay, this is one of those don't try this at home moments. Why? See, I'm notorious for making tools do what they're not designed to do. I want to rip this 11-inch board in half, and my sliding miter saw can only cut about 10 inches. Not to mention, there's no way to clamp a board down in this direction. So I used my finishing nailer to attach to a long board running perpendicular so that I can clamp it down. Just long enough to make the cut. That may not be the best choice. <laughs> yourself killed hey look guys it worked i didn't even lose an eyeball yeah! but i did lose some sweat in this sack a lot of heat messing with this crooked nail okay okay let's get back on track i mean uh let's install these tracks to install these i'm gonna use loctite shower and surround it's an inch to grab and it holds up well in wet situations these tracks are designed so that the glass doors will not only slide, but can be lifted out of the track for easy cleaning. For this to work, the upper track is about twice as deep as the lower track, so when lifted, the glass has enough room to clear the bottom track. So it's important to remember to put the shallow track to the bottom and the deeper track to the top. It's also important to consider when your cage is sitting upside down during the install, which I did. But... It was at this moment that he knew he... I still managed to oversleep the process and put the shallow track to the top. I'm glad that it's to grab it in a permanent grab. Otherwise, I just have to put Scarlet's cage in my anti-gravity room that Elon Musk is building me. Wow. Stop lying. So the final thing I have to do to complete the structure of this build is to create a pocket to hold the belly heater. Typically, the belly heater just sticks on the bottom of an enclosure. However, they can be a fire hazard if the cord gets pitched or compressed too much. This cage will be sitting flat on the floor. I want to create a slot that I can slide the heat mat in from the back of the cage, and it won't have the weight of the cage resting on it. Again, I'm just using scrap PVC. I'll use one and a half inch wide bands to frame it out. Then I'll use a couple larger pieces to create a cover over the top. Finally, I'll silicone all the cracks so that no moisture from inside of the cage can seep down to the heater. Then I'll cut a slot on the back of the cage so I can simply slide the heat mat in. When laying out the cage decor, her warm hide will be positioned directly over the top of this heat mat. And there it is, big enough for one ball python and one dwarf. And as soon as I got it together, it was time to take it apart, because I want to paint it black. You're supposed to be able to buy black PVC board, but like I said, PVC board was only available in two stores in the state, and neither one of them had black. By the way, this is my nephew, Charlie. Him and my nephew Jacob just got in town from Florida to spend a couple of weeks with me. He'll be helping me out with his painting job. He's going to become my new cameraman, too. I should also mention the paint that I'm using is Cryline Fusion. It sticks well to PVC, and I won't have to worry about it chipping off. It's also acrylic, so it's non-toxic. Okay, I let the paint dry for a day, and now we're going to spray on expanded foam. So when it dries, we can use it to carve out the background. Unfortunately, it was getting so late in the evening, this is the only footage I got. But you get the idea. Pro tip, you can mix this foam with water and it'll dry a lot faster. Okay, it's the next day and the foam dried so we can start doing the background. But before we do that, we've collected all this wood that we can use for decor in the cage. However, I don't want to throw it straight out of the woods into the cage. So first, I need to disinfect it. So we're going to take all this wood that we collected in the wood, make sure there's no bugs in it, by purifying it. It's going to boil in water. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Okay, back to the foam. All right, we got it foamed up. Now we just got to carve it out. Yeah, so uh, at this moment, I had no idea what was ahead of me. I'll just start by saying this. If you're half motivated to make your own backgrounds, maybe you should just go buy some. But if you're in it for the long haul and want to expand your artistic abilities, then I'm going to show you how incredibly detailed you can create objects using great stuff foam. I was truly impressed myself with how much detail you could add. I must warn you though, it does appear to have some fiberglass in it, 
although not nearly as bad as wall insulation. I'll only mess with that stuff in the winter. This foam only left my hands feeling slightly irritated and not for too long. Okay, on to the second day of carving and you can start to see some detail on this piece. There was a couple low spots that I decided needed more foam, so I went back and added some. By the way, I apologize for jumping ahead and not showing a lot of the detailed carving of this piece that I'm working on. But I spent several tedious hours last night carving without a cameraman. I was more focused on perfecting my technique than framing my shots. This is a completely new type of canvas that I'm just not used to yet. It was a challenge to try to translate what I saw in my head three-dimensionally into foam, all with a series of smooth cuts and plucks. Here I moved on to the larger portion of the background. What I'm showing is how I planned out where and what I would carve. I didn't plan out any of this during the foaming stage, so I didn't leave foam higher or lower in any particular area. I just sat back and looked at it after the foam had dried and expanded to try to visualize the limbs and the branches within it. Then I traced it out with a Sharpie marker so I knew where I did not want to cut. I drew the line around my branches at least a half an inch to an inch away from my desired carving. I did this because I knew to get the three-dimensional look that I desired, I would need that space to add depth into my curves. Okay, so after I got the backgrounds carved out, the next step is to make them more durable over time and waterproof. To do that, I'm using a product called Dry Lock. It's available at most home improvement stores. It's also non-toxic, so it's safe to use inside of animal enclosures. This product can be tinted with colors or it can be painted. I'll be painting these. I found it best to use brushes with bristles rather than foam brushes to really work it into all the holes that's created by carving it. I applied three coats on each piece, all while letting it dry in between coats. I let it sit for a few days before moving on to paint. Okay, while that's drying, it's time to do the part I've been excited about. I'm going to build a water feature using styrofoam. Say what? And when I'm done, it'll be waterproof and have compression streets like concrete. 3,500 pounds per square inch. Boy, no way, boy. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. My plan was to use the flat sheets to make the bottom of the bowl, but they're not as wide as I'd like it to be. So I'm going to piece a few layers together to get the desired shape and size. Next, I'll use thicker foam to cut blocks to create the walls around the bowl. What I'm trying to mimic is a small water puddle or a stream running underneath broken branches. That's why I decided to use this triangular shape and to place the wide edge towards the front of the enclosure to give it that fill of depth that you would get when looking upstream. And if you're wondering, to simplify the cutting process, I'm using a hot wire tool that I bought off of Amazon. It does make awful fumes though, so if you use one, make sure you use it outside or in a very well ventilated place. It'd be better to wear a mask while doing this, but unfortunately I can't breathe behind one. I know, I know, that's a taboo problem to have, right? You don't want to go here. You don't want to go here. Wait, was that Bill Clinton? Anyway, I'm using the same Loctite power grab that I did on the tracks on the front of the enclosure earlier. But truthfully, it doesn't matter what I use because the next step is going to lock everything together. But first, it's time to carve the intricate detail. I decided to carve the edges of the bowl and the limbs themselves. The hot wire tool not only helped make cutting easier, but it's perfect for adding the detail. I was able to transform the squared sides into lifelike, rounded shape limbs. I paid close attention to add detail in the corners where the limbs would meet to make sure that they could be distinguished from one another. Keeping in mind that my main objective is to make this look less like a water dish and more like a puddle between a couple broken limbs. I also placed small angular blocks all around the interior perimeter of the puddle. I wanted to give it the contoured bank that a real puddle or a stream would have. By rounding over the bottom edges of the limbs, I was able to give it the feel that they're separate from the water puddle itself. I was careful not to carve too deep on the bottom edge because I didn't want the walls to get brittle because they are carved on the outside edge as well as the inside edge. This particular styrofoam block is two inches thick, so I figure if I carve it a half inch on both sides, I still have a one inch thick wall. That should be durable enough. And after I got the basic shape of the limbs I wanted, I played around and added more detail. I took the time to give each limb bark with a couple knots in some areas where there was cracks in the tree, just to give it that extra level of realism. 
And now here's where the magic happens. We finished making the water ball, the water feature. We use some styrofoam blocks, create a perimeter, so it's easy to set it down in there and separate it from the rest of the dirt. So now we're going to use this product called Foam Coat. We got three pounds of this powder mixed up. Uh, we're going to mix it up with eight ounces of water, and then we have their grit, which is going to make the surface more like a stone and look more natural. And this is a product they sell called Bounce. This makes it extra sturdy and also will stick to anything including non-porous surfaces like PVC, hopefully. Okay, now that we got everything weighed out on a kitchen scale, I got Charlie mixing it up. This stuff is a lot like concrete in that you can mix it at various slumps or thicknesses depending on your application. I started out mixing it extra thick to really pile on that first layer. So we found out that this kind of brush is not good. It just soaks it all into bristles. Feel like you wasted a lot of material. So the foam brush works better. That's the first coat. I mixed it up really thick. Real thick paste. So I can fill in all the little cracks. And then on the next layer we'll mix it thinner. So now that I got a good thick layer on there, I'm going to mix it a little bit runnier this time. That will allow it to get to the smaller cracks and crevices that the thick page can't reach. Now that I've allowed it to dry some, I'm going back with an extra thick coat on the interior of the bowl just to reinforce it where the water will be sitting. Okay, we got good sufficient coverage on everything. Now we just got to let it dry. So as I'm demonstrating here, this is very easy cleanup material. It takes nothing to get it off your hands. Okay, now that all the foam is cut, carved, and coated, we can move on to the fun stuff, painting. What I'm using is a Lazy Man's paint gun. A couple cheap spray bottles that I bought off of Amazon, and I'm mixing my paint just diluted enough to spray through the nozzle. So I'm starting with my base layer, which is just simply black. It's always good to start with the background and work your way to the foreground. In other words, start with the dark colors, the shadows, and work your way towards the details and the highlights. And as you can see, we got the first layer on. So this next bottle I mixed up is a very dark brown. I'm just going to start adding on the layers of color now. And while I still have the black paint out, I'm also going to go ahead and start putting the dark base color on the water bowl. And here you can see where I'm starting to build up the color and bark on the tree. I now stopped using the water bottle and I moved on to the dry brush technique. If you are familiar with the dry brush technique, it's basically how you waste as much paint as possible by smearing the majority on the palette and barely getting any on your canvas or foam. The idea is to avoid putting on an entire new layer of another color, but rather to lightly smear the remaining paint residue that's in the brush onto the object to be painted. By stacking up layer upon layer of color, each subsequent layer being slightly lighter in color than the previous one, I'll be able to bring this part to life. I'm doing all these layers with only three colors. I'm using black, a brown, and a light beige. Mm. I'm just changing the ratios of each color to progressively produce a slightly lighter shade as I move along. Nice. Now I start stacking color on the water bowl. Even at this stage, I'm super happy about how this has turned out. I'm also impressed at how durable this foam coat feels. It's stated to have a compression strength of 3,500 PSI after 28 days, but I believe that's without adding the bounce. I'm not sure how much that will help the compression strength, but it's said to increase the durability substantially. Oh, and another fun fact about this product, it's fireproof. Not as that matters in the case of a water bowl. Oh yeah, speaking of water, this is an exterior foam coat, so it holds up longer when exposed to moisture, even though I'll be sealing it all up. And again, I'm going back over what's already dried, adding some lighter colors, just trying to bring that bark to life. Very nice. You can really start to see the details in the surface texture now as the highlights take effect. Whoa! The key to a successful dry brushing is a light hand. By gently dragging the brush just on the surface, you avoid applying the lighter highlighting colors to the deeper crevices where the darker background colors lie. 
So what I'm doing here is I mixed up some very diluted green paint in a spray bottle, and I'm spraying it on the branches in the water bowl to try to give the appearance of moths and algae. Uh-huh. By painting the bottom of the water bowl like this, it'll give the water a natural dark and murky look, like you would see in nature. Now, with anything I paint or draw, I can go on for days and days and days, never being satisfied with the detail. But I'm going to stop right here. Now, I got one last step. All I got to do is seal this up so that no moisture in the cage makes this paint run. After all, it is water-based. So to do this, I'm going to let my boy Hadzi showcase the next product. This is a non-toxic acrylic paint sealer made by RainGuard. It's completely safe to use with anything that'll go in an animal enclosure, as long as you let it dry first. Oh, okay. Like many of these products, it does have a strong smell, so I'll be letting this enclosure air out for a week before adding scarlet. Two to three coats should be sufficient, but while I had enough mixed up, I continue to add layers until I can see it beating off the surface and no more penetrating the foam. I also made sure to get sufficient coverage over the water bowl. Afterwards, I performed a flood test. This was not only to check for leaks, but I wanted to make sure that there was no paint residue appearing in the water. That would indicate that a portion of the paint was not sealed. Now it's finally time for the big step. I'm sorry I didn't get any footage of the reassembly after bringing the pieces inside, but logistically, it was a struggle. So anyway, now that it was reassembled, the next step was to place the branches we had cleaned in my hot tub into the enclosure. I positioned them in what appeared to be good locations against the background, where she could create a hide on each side. Then I locked them in using great stuff foam, as well as foam the cracks where the background pieces met in the corners. Next, I put up the 70 watt heat panel over the hot side of the enclosure. Having a portion of a position over the water bowl should also promote slightly higher humidity levels on this side of the enclosure. Soon, I'll be buying a thermostat that I can use to precisely control this heat panel, as well as a belly heater. So after spending several days wearing my hands out with knives, I realized the multi-tool is perfect for carving this foam. The only problem is it really throws a lot of particles in the air. So I do it, I had Charlie vacuum in the air around me. But for the purpose of making this small video clip, I didn't want the vacuum cleaner noise in the video, so I just covered my face up with my shirt. I also realized while doing this how tough that dry lock is. I was able to use a multi-tool to scrape off excess expanding foam from the surface of the finished background without even scuffing the paint. Now I just gotta dry lock these sections of foam and mix up some paint and blend them back in. But first, I'm gonna go ahead and silicone around the entire bottom of the enclosure. Considering there's gonna be so much moisture in this enclosure, I really don't want it leaking all over the floor. Okay, I decided that if I'm gonna be able to blend the paint right, I really need some light. So I'm gonna go ahead and mount up her LED light into the top of the enclosure. This is when it occurred to me that I don't have any brackets to mount her light yet. But I do have a strip of aluminum or some of you guys like to call aluminium. I'm gonna cut down some pieces of it, bend it on my vise, and create some simple brackets that I can mount this thing up with. This is not something I anticipated having to do when I started this build, but while doing it, I'm reminded of how much I really enjoy working with metal. I'm doing projects all the time of wood, but there's something about fabricating out of metal that I just really enjoy. One day when I build a shop, I'll have a room dedicated solely to metal work. So because I don't feel like digging out my Dremel on a grinding wheel, I'm just going to use my hammer and lightly tap over any sharp edges on these brackets. I'm going to go ahead and use a metal bit and pre-drill these holes. Because I don't have any cell tapping screws that I'll be using for this, I'm just going to use a couple of drywall screws I have laying around. I decided to go ahead and attach the bracket to this board before installing the light into the top of the enclosure for several reasons. Number one, the shortest screws that I can currently find are an inch long. And since my PVC is a half inch, I didn't want the tip of the screw sticking out of the top or down into the enclosure. Also, the heat panel that I just installed is roughly an inch thick. By spacing the light the thickness of this board away from the top, I'll ensure that the heat panel isn't preventing any of the lumens from reaching all the way down to my plants. Now back inside, I'm going to check the fit of my custom order glass doors. Not going to lie, I was a little bit nervous about this fit. And I don't have to worry about this stuff breaking. It's heavy duty, quarter inch thick, tempered glass. Okay, are you ready for this? I've added the dirt, the sphagnum moss, and the leaf litter. 
Oh, yeah, and how did I fail to mention all that beautiful green moss? Now it looks like we're really getting somewhere. Now I've thrown in various ferns, some spider wart for some color, otherwise known as the Wandering Jew. Don't ask me why I didn't name it. Okay, now I think I need a cleanup crew. How about some springtails and isopods? I'm going to start with the Priscillianatus pruinosus, also known as the Powdered Blues. I'm also going to add some powdered oranges, just another morph of the Priscillianatus pruinosus. If you're wondering what an isopod is, it's what you know as a roly-poly. They're all going to help break down the waste, as well as help prevent from the infestation of any unwanted pests. Here I managed to catch a few on camera before they disappeared into the dirt. Finally, I added the Trocarina tomatosa, also known as the Dwarf Whites. For some reason, I didn't get that on camera. Oh, and I almost forgot. I put in this LED so I could look at her at night and not disturb her. And with all that done, it seems like there's only one thing left to do. That's right. It's time to put my baby girl in her new home. This right here is what it's all about. The hours, the aggravation, the sweat, all the cleanup. It was all about this moment. Giving my girl a better life. And the truth is, the ball python is truly fine in a basic tub setup. They're an ambush predator. They prefer to stay hidden away until opportunity knocks. But with my animals, it's not about providing the basic level of care for them to maintain. I want to provide them with more enrichment, more stimulation. Because in the end, what fun is a mundane life? We can all learn to appreciate the finer things in life. Overall, I'd say this project was a success. I'm pretty sure within a few months, these plants will have grown up, provided a lot more coverage to make her feel even more secure. She sure didn't hesitate to explore every potential hiding place and all of her new plants. Even though ball pythons are terrestrial, meaning they're primarily a ground-dwelling species, they still enjoy the ability to stretch out vertically and even lay across a branch from time to time. And I'm going to enjoy watching her do it. Okay, friends, if you stuck with me through the video this long, I'd like to thank you for your time. If you enjoyed that video, hit the like button if you're so inclined. And if you didn't, you probably just suck. If you want to see more of my life with my animals and my fun builds, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if you know anybody that might enjoy this content, share it with them. And y'all have a good one. Say bye-bye, Scarlet. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Oh, that pot? What are these dangerous beasts down there? Hey, I'm soaking here.